So we are now well into the three weeks, and during the three weeks, it is customary to study the laws of the Beis HaMikdash, because through studying the laws of the Beis HaMikdash, we hasten its realization, as God told the prophet Ezekiel, Yechesko, after the destruction of, of the first Beis HaMikdash and the subsequent exile, that he instructed him to teach the Jews about the temple, and thereby... Uh, in a spiritual sense, build it and hasten its realization. So we study the laws of the temple as is found in scripture, that is the book of Ezekiel, who has the vision of the final temple, and in the Talmud tractate Midos, which means med measures, which is a tractate, tractate dealing exclusively with the measures and dimensions of the temple. And as we shall this morning, we study the these laws as they are codified by the Rambam, Maimonides, in Hilchas Beis Abchira, the laws of God's chosen house. Now just a bit of background, I mentioned Ezekiel before, so here is the context and the history. The first temple built by King Solomon was destroyed after 410 years. As mentioned, the subsequent Babylonian exile. As mentioned, God instructed Ezekiel to teach them about the temple. This was the vision. Ezekiel had a vision of what turns out to be the final and third temple. And he, re he records his, his, uh, his vision in the book of Ezekiel. Now the thing is that when they built the second temple, they did not build it according to the design exclusively of Ezekiel's vision, first and foremost because many details were unclear. So what they did was the second temple was built as a hybrid based on King Solomon's, namely the first, and whatever could be understood of the third, they incorporated. And that's what we're studying now. King Hero then expanded it much later. So we are studying now is the second Beis HaMikdash, which is, as mentioned, a hybrid between the first and the third. By studying these laws, this will enable us also to have gain clarity when Mashiach comes, although Mashiach will teach this himself, exactly how to build the third temple. Moreover, the third temple, there are two views where the man builds it all together, or it comes ready-made from heaven. So, the reconciliation of these two views is that it's both. It'll come both from heaven, but the gates and doors will be supplied by man. Now, let's begin. Why would Ezekiel have a vision of the third temple if you're waiting for the first building of the second one, the one first one destroyed? Because in theory it's possible had they merited and done shuva, that would have been the final temple. It could have been. Okay. It wasn't to be. But still, it's... So it became it's, the third temple only because of the second temple. That's why it became, yeah. It wasn't told... By, so it, it wasn't like, yeah, he was told, here's the third temple. Right, it's just, here's the temple. It, yeah. it becomes the third temple. All right, so the top of your page, in the name of God, Lord of the world, then the Rambam, as he does before every one of his 14 books, this is book number eight, every book is introduced by a verse, somewhere from scripture. So here's the verse in front of you, it's from where? Where's this verse from? It's in the Hebrew. Tehillim. Tehillim. So in the book of Psalms, the verse reads, Shalu Shloim Yerushalayim, it's a famous verse. <laughs> uh, sounds familiar? Yishloyo Oyavoyich, we say it every day, friends, in the, in the end of Ein Kelekeinu, which is before the Oleinu. So the verse reads, Inquire of the welfare of Jerusalem. Those who love you will enjoy tranquility. Why do you think that Rambam chose this verse to introduce the laws of the construction or the dimensions of the temple. Why do you think he chose this of all the verses in scripture? First and foremost, because anybody? The verse, we're talking about the verse. So why choose this verse? Well, first and foremost, it talks about Jerusalem. Shalu Shloim Yerushalayim. The verse makes reference to Jerusalem, and the temple is the uh, the focal point of Jerusalem, for that matter, the world, but certainly Jerusalem. A lot of verses outside of Jerusalem. Pardon? A lot of verses 
in Tehillim and Lo Jerusalem. I can't hear you. It's not the only verse in Tehillim and Lo Jerusalem. Now that's true. It's not the only verse that talks about Jerusalem. What's unique about this one is that it says inquire about it. And implied or conveyed in inquiry is learn about it, study about it. So that's why he chooses this verse. So that's why I translated Shalom. This you should be capitalized? What? No. Who's the you? Jerusalem. So it could be. Jerusalem. Could, if, I guess so. Yeah. All right. So Sefer Shmini is the eighth book. For Sefer Aveda, the book of service which deals with all of the servers in the Holy Temple. <clears throat> and then he goes on to outline that there are uh, nine sets of halachas, and we're going to be dealing with the first one, Hilchas <laughs> Beis And then the other laws follow, as you can see in the page in front of you. Now, what does Beis Abchira mean? Hilchas Beis Abchira means the laws of God's chosen house. What's he referring to? Temple. The Temple. So the question is, why uh, is the Rambam referring it to it as God's chosen house and not its far more common name, which is simply the base Hamikdash, the holy house of the holy temple? And in fact, as we'll see in a minute, or two, or three, the opening law where he quotes from the Torah the commandment to build a temple. The Torah itself uses, and the Rambam quotes it in law number one, mikdash, make for me a mikdash, a sacred place. So that makes the question stronger. Why is he referring to it as God's chosen house? Here are two answers. Answer number one, by calling it God's chosen house and not the holy temple, the Rambam is underscoring the eternity of its holiness. Holiness can come and holiness can go if we are not deserving. But when God chooses something, the idea of a free choice means it's unconditional. Free choice means free of all consideration. So God chose this place, the Rambam is saying, by this choice of words, you should know already that the eternity and the sanctity of that place is eternal up until this day, even if it's destroyed. Why? Because it is God's chosen house, not just holy, which could imply temp temporary. There's many other things. Um, a synagogue is a holy place only while it stands. Uh, if you sell it, this place isn't holy anymore. The temple, the place is holy forever because it's God's chosen house, yeah? So could it be referring to the actual location as opposed to the physical structure? Whereas the Beit HaKnikdash is really... The structure, so yeah. The physical structure, as opposed to, for example, there's one, two, and three, and Three. And so the place is really more of the location. Yeah, so you're suggesting the location, which which is true, that, that very place, regardless of a building being there or not. But as we have learned in the past at great length, the building in essence is still there anyway, underground. The Holy of Holies, when Shlomo Melech built King Solomon, built the temple, he built two Holy of Holies, one above ground and one below ground. And that's still there till this very day, and that's where the ark is. And therefore, even the building is eternal. But you're correct, it's the, the location is forever sacred. Unlike, place? again, a synagogue or any other holy place. King Ordos decided to renovate that temple. We mentioned that, yeah. All the temple, he rebuilt it, and they said it was never such a nice building in the whole Roman Empire, like the temple. In the world, and that's, in that's, the, world, yes. that's the dimensions so, that we're learning now. Rambam mentioned about this, that it's the one we're talking about, as I said. This, this is the one we're talking about. The Rambam's dimensions are based on the tractate Midas, and tractate Midas is the dimensions of that temple. And he was a tyrant. Yeah, that's one good thing he did. What? He was a tyrant. What? Uh, yeah. When you say your place is holy, what, what does that mean? Even? I don't even know what it means. I mean, there's a mosque sitting on that place. Yeah. So what it means is that the divine presence never departs. Even though there's a mosque, even though there's a mosque on it, and it means we cannot go in certain parts of it, which would the holy of holies would have stood. The sanctity is still there, and if we and the other places as well, we have to treat with the same reverence that we would if the temple was standing, and that is a person's not supposed to, as we'll see later, walk with his staff, and, uh, and a person can't uh, spit in the holy uh, on the area. The laws that govern 
but reverence. The holiness is really only manifested to us by things we can't do. There. Yeah, it's more a tangible, but just things we can't do. That's how you would see it. I mean, maybe holy people can feel it, uh, but for most of us, it's more things you can't do. So that's one reason why it's called God's chosen house. Now, another reason, almost the opposite reason. If you say something is chosen, from, chosen, what are you implying? There's also something else from which it was chosen from. Holy place, holy place stands independently. But the, word, the, the concept of choice implies other things that could have been and were not. So subtly conveyed in this term, God's chosen house is, that God chose this house to manifest his presence, but all other homes, your home, the temple should be holy too. It's actually drawing an association with other places as well. Okay, so that's the second opposite. The first answer was saying the exclu exclusivity of the chosen house. This is forever holy. But it's also conveying that there's an array. God chose this one. The other ones also have, are, are in the picture. What are the other ones? Your home, your temple. They should also be holy and emulate this place. Let's begin. So says the Rambam, Hilchas Beis Abchida, the laws of God's chosen house. We're going out to the middle of the page. Yesh Bechlal, Bechlolon Sheish Mitzvahs. There are six mitzvahs, six commandments, uh, which are part of this mitzvah to, uh, uh, of the, of the Beis Mikdash. And the mitzvahs divide into two groups, as they always do. Shleish Mitzvahs, I say in this case, there are three affirmative commandments. Besholish Mitzvahs, Leish, I say, and three prohibitions the zeal proton and these are the details this is the way every single one of the 14 books of the rambam begins it begins with first identifying the scriptural commandments associated with this particular mitzvah and then he goes on to elaborate in in the details of these of these commandments so he lists them there number one live nice mikdash is a commandment to build a mikdash a holy house then there's a prohibition shle live nice hamis beach gozis the altar, and as he tells us later, it's not just the altar, it's the entire temple, should not be built of hewn stone. Well, how in heaven's name did they cut the stone? They didn't hew it. It means not on the temple mount. The, the stones had to be cut off the temple mount and then brought already cut. The Torah says that the sound of, uh, of uh, iron should not be heard on the temple mount, and the reason being, specifically, it says it about the altar, because the altar prolongs the life of man and iron is an instrument of war so it should not be heard or part of the building at least on the temple mount and as you know in the first temple the first basin they didn't use iron at all so how was the stone was cut it was cut by this creature which we obviously can no longer uh, can access king solomon got it he got this creature through the agency of the head of all the demons, whatever that means, Ashmedai is his name. He summoned him, and Ashmedai was able to procure this kind of worm-like creature called the Shamir, and it had this extraordinary ability placed on a rock. It just split it perfectly all the way down, and that's what they used. Um, the Rebbe would always send a message to Prime Minister Shamir when he was Prime Minister. We see this in the dollars frequently, when people would come with a message or they were going... Uh, going to see him, we have a meeting with him, and in the Rebbe's uh, letters to him, which by the way, one of them he kept always on his desk, he's interviewed, he says that in one of the interviews, he keeps this letter always on his on his desk, one of the Rebbe's letters to him, so the message would be to remember his name is Shamir, and Shamir means don't let anything stand in your way, you make your decision, and you will see that everything will open up, stay firm, and the Things will open, split easily without the need even to fight. Just hold your ground. Showing weakness will just uh, complicate matters. That was uh, that was message to Shamir. Okay, so that's that second law, not to build the altar of hewn stones. By that we mean again using iron uh, on the temple mount. Now, interestingly, the third temple we've spoken about this in the past uh, will employ iron. Why is that? Why the change? because then they will beat their swords into plowshares. So no longer will iron, metal, steel be the instruments of war, on the contrary, the instrument of life. That's the whole messianic era. So then 
it would be appropriate to have barzel iron in the temple structure, but not until Mashiach comes. You've also pointed out the Hebrew word for barzel is barzel, beis reish uh, zayin lamed, which stands for the four mothers of the twelve tribes of Israel. Bila, Rochel, Zilpa, and Leah. And we've explained at length in the previous years. Of course, you will remember that what this means is that the power of transformation is a uniquely feminine power. The male resolves conflict <coughs> by force. That's how he traditionally uh, brings peace. You defeat your enemy. But that's not a true peace. It's only a peace because you're stronger. You shout louder, you've killed more, you've beaten him into submission. True peace is transformation, that's the messianic era. And that's a feminine quality to be able to nurture the good within the other and to turn the enemy into an ally, that's the ultimate peace, that's the messianic era. That's a feminine uh, property and therefore barzel, which is iron, which represents this transformation, alludes to our founding mothers, the mothers of the tribes. Next. <laughs> not to go up by steps onto the altar. The altar was a very high structure. The altar in the second base of Migdash was 10 cubits high. That's about the height of this ceiling. It's a massive structure with, as we learned, uh, three pyres of wood on it. And so to yet to get there, you know, by some means, obviously, to get to the top of it, to place the offerings, the Torah says it has to be what? A ramp, but not steps. Why not steps? In order, quote, not to reveal your nakedness upon it. A step causes an exaggerated move. One should walk up, not with exaggerated moves. It's, it's holy, and therefore one treats it with reverence. They wore trousers, to be sure. But still, symbolically, the exposing nakedness, as it were, unnecessarily. We learned about this here, too. And we learned that famous commentary of Rashi. We went into a lot of detail where Rashi tells us that from here we learn that the Torah is concerned, the point of being the Torah is concerned with the feelings and respect of an inanimate object, the ramp, the altar, and much more so your fellow human being. That's the point here, that we should be concerned and sensitive to the, their feelings. Even, mind you, when they're not aware that they're being spoken about or addressed, etc. Have you learned the details of that? All right, so no steps, only a ramp. The ramp was very long. It was 32 cubits which is very long again, the cubit is, is a foot and a half, and there were sub-ramps that led off it from the side, as the Rambam describes in detail when we get to, the, to that part. He talks about the uh, dimensions of the altar. Next, so that was, so far we have one positive command and two negative. Now another positive command, to revere the sanctuary. Ligira min amikdash, this was brought up earlier, this applies today as well. Our conduct has to be such on the temple grounds that is respectful. The details of that described later. And finally, in terms of the positive commands, number five, which is the third positive <coughs> command, <coughs> to keep a guard around the sanctuary. There was a guard of both Kainim and Levim, as he will describe in detail at various points, 24-7 was a guard. As the Rambam says, these, this was an honorary guard. It wasn't, they weren't armed. It wasn't a guard uh, to protect from invaders. There's no need for that. When we observe Hashem's law, the temple protects us. No need for us to protect the temple. So why was this guard? It's a sign of honor and reverence. It's part, part, of, part of respect. And finally, number six, the prohibition is not to leave the sanctuary unguarded, which means it has to be 24-7. So in other words, failure to have those on regards there transgresses both a positive and a negative commandment. Many times you have the same commandment, do it, and then the Torah says, and do not not do it. Well, if you said do it, you don't have to tell us not to not do it. We often Torah will do that because God wants to say that failure is two transgressions. You failed to do what I told you, you also did what I said not to do, thereby God's conveying the seriousness of that particular commandment. It's not just do, it's also don't not do it. You follow? Okay. Now we begin the actual laws. Turn the page. (laughs) 
So law number one, mitzvah say it's a positive command. Yeah, we'll say it in Hebrew, la'atzot, bayit la'ashem, to make a home for God. Muchan, prepared or in readiness. Diyot makrivim be'akarbanot, to offer there the sacrifices. All the sacrifices, the daily communal sacrifices, the, pr- the private sacrifices, the holiday offerings, etc. All the offerings are offered there on the altar in the Beit HaMikdash. Furthermore, V'chogagin elav shalosh pamim b'shana, and it is, we celebrate there three times a year, and of course those, that's the pilgrimage holidays, Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot, where uh, we are obligated to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Temple to see God and to be seen by God, as it were. Shenemar, as it is written, Va'osuli Mikdash, God says, You shall make for me a Mikdash. This is referring to this sanctuary in the desert, but it refers to its further incarnation, namely the permanent building that was built in Jerusalem. As the Rambam will tell us the history of how things evolved. Let's just conclude the paragraph. The Torah uh, describes in detail the Mishkan, the sanctuary which Moshe Rabbeinu built. But that was only temporary, as the Torah itself says in Deuteronomy. Why are you bring your sacrifices here? Because at present you have not come yet to the final resting place and inheritance of my house. And I will show that to you when the time comes. And that was the time of King David <coughs> and the prophet Nathan or Nathan. That's when God revealed that the permanent location will be Jerusalem as we'll learn about in the next law. Now, just to point out something over here, so the uh, very important uh, discussion, and that is, so what's the, the essence and the objective of the temple? So we, we mentioned this the other day when we after davening briefly a little more detail now. And that is, there are two views. There's the Rambam, the one we just quoted now, who's very clear. If I ask you in black, you know, what's the purpose? What's the definition of the temple? What does he say? He defined it very simply as a place where we bring the sacrifices and we make our pilgrims to. Pretty clear. There's another view. That's the view of the Ramban, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, Nachmanides. So there's Maimonides and Nachmanides. Nachmanides lived later. And uh, here and there um, disputes the Rambam, but for the most part, actually, he defended the Rambam uh, against his detractors, which is another story, and vindicated him. Rambam's works, many of them met tremendous opposition, including, including the Mishnah Torah, this, this work. At any rate, but here he argues. What's the argument? He says that that's not the definition of the temple. The definition of the temple is quite simply the place where God's presence is revealed. Where the Shekhinah resides. That's very different. It couldn't be more different. In other words, is it the place where man serves God? Is that what its essence is? Or is it where God's presence is manifest on earth? Now clearly it's both. And they're not arguing it's one or the other. The argument is what is the primary definition? So the Rambam is a halachist. That means, in this work anyway, his point is practical uh, law, and that's why he says, he, as you mentioned a, a moment, how, how does divine? What does it mean? The divine presence manifests. It's an intangible. True, during the first temple, there were miracles that were constant that you could see. But even that, you're not seeing the divine presence. You're seeing the consequence of the divine presence. That's mystical. That's divine. It's a holy place. Maybe some people feel it. Certainly, some people do. Many don't. That's mystical. Practical is, what do you do there? You bring the sacrifices, you come there three times a year. So what I'm telling you is, the Rambam, therefore, who, was, who wrote 
this law of practicalities. He talks about the practical. What do you do? You bring sacrifices and you go there three times a year, etc. Nachmanides was a mystic. He was a Kabbalist. His, his writings are suffused with, with Kabbalah and insights. He talks about the more mystical dimension, and that is what's the temple, the place where the divine presence is manifest. Now, the Rambam, of course, also agrees that that's what it is. And Nachmanides also agrees, of course, that that's a place where we bring our sacrifices. They're emphasizing two different dimensions, the practical, practical or the mystical dimension. Clear? So the words of Kabbalah, is it, not is it, there's both dimensions. There's from below to above, we are meeting God, and there's from above to below, where God manifests here on earth. So it's both, each one is emphasizing the other, the other aspect. Clear? Okay. Let's continue. Even so we just said, he just finished saying that initially God's house was this temporary, as you all know, the Mishkan, the sanctuary, interlocking boards that were assembled and disassembled. Is that the opposite of assembled? Taken apart? Mm. Uh, when they traveled. So that's how things were at the outset. And this is how things evolved. Once, however, they entered the land, so this is what transpired. Hamidu ha Mishkan be Gilgal. They first erected the sanctuary in a place called Gilgal, identifiable till this very day. Arba Esrei Shana, for the fourteen years, Shekovshu, which under Joshua they conquered the land, and then for Shecholku, and they divided it. Specifically, it took seven years to conquer the land, and another seven years to divide it. And why it took seven years to divide? Well, it was not an easy thing. Uh, the tribal <coughs> divisions were clear. That was already determined in the desert. In fact, it was this week's Parsha. Parsha Spinchas it tells us how they determined the division according to the tribes. It was an elaborate process designed that no one should ever question that this is the way it should be. It was both uh, underscored by logic and by the divine hand and all kinds of things that everybody can see that it's from Hashem and it's meant to be and it makes sense and we can see affirmed by, by God too. But that's a division only of the tribal properties. The real you know, uh, challenge was to divide it amongst families. It would depend on the size of the families, etc. So that took seven years. And there was a whole complex uh, formula by which it was divided as well as we learned in this week's parsha in Rashi. Anyway, so for 14 years, where was the Mishkan? A place called? Shiva. No, first Gilgal. place? Gilgal. 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 Now, from Misham and from there, Baal is Shiloh. They came to Shiloh or Shiloh. And here it starts to evolve. Ubonu Shom Bayez Shalavonim. Knowing that it's going to be a permanent home. So they start the process and they build it of stone. But it wasn't entirely permanent. It's quasi, it's the in-between. Well, But they put, for a roof, the tapestries of the sanctuary. The Loi HaYesham Tikra did not have a permanent roof. Vishin Samach Tes 369 years. That's a long time. That's when, when generations. The, Pardon? When the temple was in Shiloh, did people come there three times a yeah, year? Yeah, yeah, they did, yeah, they did. In fact, the famous story of the birth of, which we say in Rosh Hashanah, the birth of the prophet Samuel, was one of these pilgrimages that Elkanah, this man, had made to the Mishkan. He was coming for Sukkot, he came early, he was there Rosh Hashanah. Now, there was, yeah, this was the place where they, uh, the, the nerve center, as long as the Mishkan stood, sacrifices could not be brought anywhere else, only there. No one could build their own altar and offer to God. Before it, re it was here, when it was in Gilgal, it, you could, the Torah is, is clear. Individuals may bring their offerings to God, only <coughs> that will stop once I have the permanent, when God says, once I pointed out the permanent place. So when, when, when Shiloh was built in Shiloh, it had that permanence to it that 
only sacrifices were brought there. So it was the nerve center of the entire people, the spiritual nerve center. And it says uh, from there they What are you asking? I'm asking if they divided the land, they conquered it, and divided it, they said it. Where are they going now? The builders, the uh, the Mishkan. The builders of the Mishkan, the, the Levites, the ones that are in charge of the Mishkan. So when it says from there they came, you're talking about the builders going to Yeah, so they mean they came. Those are responsible, the Levim, the Kohanim. And why did they choose this particular place? As opposed to? Just as they built it later, why say they came and not just they built it in Shiloh? I understand. That's your, that you're asking. No, that was my first question. The second question is why Shiloh? Why Shiloh? Yeah. Maybe it, Jerusalem was not conquered by that time yet. Who? Jerusalem was not conquered yeah, by that time. Jerusalem was not mentioned yet. No, Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't. It, it wasn't conquered by that exactly point. That's then, correct. Then. Why they chose that? I need to look up whether it was that by the word of God, a prophetic thing. It probably was a prophetic instruction that should be built over here. Your shrine is clear, we know. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. They didn't know it now. No, no, but and later. Point, they were so this too, this too was by the, by the divine <laughs> word, but I'll, I'll double check that. <coughs> and maybe considerations for its centrality as well, right? A- accessibility. I understand that if they're traveling, so in the desert, you travel, you go from here to there. Then they go to Gilgal, they're going, they're also not settled yet. But once they divide the land and they know where they are, where are they going? Uh, yeah, who's again? The they is again. The they, I just, As I told you, the they is the Levim right. and the Koyunim. Okay. That's all. They were concentrated there, the Levim and Koyunim, now they're all coming here. This is now the, the home where, where they serve Hashem daily in the Mishkan. The Rambam continues. Kushemes Eli, when Eli the high priest died, Chorav, it was destroyed. Ubol and Noiv, and they came to a place called Nov, Ubon Shon Mikdash, and they built there the Mikdash. Kushemes Shmuel, and when Samuel died, Chorav, it was destroyed again. Ubol the Givain, and they came to Givain. Ubon Hashem Mikdash, and they built it there. Um Givain bol the Beis Elamim, and it's from there that they came. Beis Elamim means literally to the eternal structure in Jerusalem. The main Noiv Givain Sheva v'Chamishim Shana. The total number of years that it was in Noiv and Givain was seventy-five. Now some detail over here. Pardon? Fifty-seven. I'm sorry, fifty-seven. Uh, fifty-seven. Well, the detail is, yeah, whenever it says it was 37, I'm sorry, given 37 and 20 years in Nov, yeah? Whenever it says it was destroyed, it, it, it mean they, they took it apart? Is that what they mean? They, they, well, the last time it was taken apart. I mean, they did, no, there was no, nobody else did it. I mean, it wasn't externally done. King Saul destroyed, yeah, King Saul destroyed the last from Nov and came to Givain. Do they mean dismantle? Yeah. Not yeah. In this case, it means dismantle, but in the first case, okay, I need to look into that also. Dismantle, it's stone. No, but destroyed sounds like somebody came and, That's right. and conquered. With, conquered, with, yeah. Uh, and that was, yeah. With bulldozers and destroyed it. Because it's not wood, it's stone. Right, I'm just saying, did they take it, they took it apart themselves, no? It's not by conquerors. Not by conquerors. No, no, no. Okay. To be, Mr. Hashem, can you just see if there is. Okay, just a question that's raised over here is, if the Rebbe asks, I recall, I'm sure it's somewhere here. This is fascinating, but why are we getting a history lesson? The Rambam is not a book of history. The Rambam is a book of, of Halacha. So why the history? Question's clear? If I recall correctly, I'm trying to find it here, I'm sure it's somewhere here. The Rambam is, is, is giving us the history, all to point out that it's a eternal commandment that was fulfilled uninterruptedly from the time 
of Moshe Rabbeinu to the time they built it in Jerusalem. It's not two separate things. It's the same commandment evolving. So therefore he gives the read of the history to show you should be aware. Because the verse he quoted was the Mishkan, and that applies all the way till the temple built in Jerusalem. The, the temple is still in force, that commandment, but we need the certain conditions to fulfill it. But he wants to bring out that from the time it was commanded till it was built in Jerusalem, it's one continuous Mishkan located in separate places, but the mitzvah was fulfilled in this evolving way, permanently. That, as I recall, is the reason for this history lesson. All right, friends, in Mitzvah Shem, to be continued. Rabbi, what happens if you're not in the 